Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Bealton Baptist Church. We're so glad you're here today, whether you are watching us on Facebook or whether you are here in person. We're so happy to see you. If this is the first time you have joined us, um, please check out, out our website at bealtonbc.org. If you have a prayer request, please email those to bealtonbc at comcast.net. We would love to pray for whatever's on your heart today. Thank you. And uh, two announcements, which I'm excited about. Um, we were getting ready to do our first responders campaign when COVID hit. And the people who probably needed our support the most, we had to kind of hold off. So we are beginning that again, and we're going to collect items. You can see them up there. If it's small, look on your e-blast. Um, and you can help by donating, but make sure everything you bring is pre-packaged. So no home good muffins or cookies this year um, and we can still show them our love if you want to drop a card in yourself when you donate um, the food items that's that's just as appreciated so however creative you want to be we'll have a couple of weeks um, till I think Wednesday July 5th 15th I mean that's when we'll uh, put some baskets together into that weekend the other new thing, and I don't want to upset anybody if you don't like change, I don't either, but in two weeks, instead of doing Facebook Live, we're going to do YouTube Live. We'll still put it on Facebook, but not till 11 o'clock, and the reason for this is YouTube is made for clarity and seeing things. That's just what they do, and um, so two weeks, that's where you can find us. It's still built in Baptist Church, so it's easy to find. In fact, you'll find a lot of Rebecca's videos on there right now with our children and Bob's sermons. So check it out this week and see. All right, would y'all stay with us this morning? I am so excited because this is our first time that we can actually commune together. So we want to prepare our hearts as we praise the God who died for us when we were in the midst of sin. And we get to partake um, in a few moments after we get our hearts right and just remember what he did when he shed his blood for us. We are blessed with so much that sometimes we miss the message, don't we? I know I do. And it's just been heavy on my heart to stop and think about. This isn't just another story. This happened. Not many of us have maybe made it over to Israel and Jerusalem and Bethlehem and seen the road of the cross and the different places that Paul went to set up churches to tell the good news. But it is real. And it is our job to make sure our hearts are right. And when we take of the Lord's Supper to picture what he did for us, go back and remember your personal salvation. I know I was five years old. And that was young, and, and maybe I didn't understand the brevity of it all, but for a five-year-old, I knew. I knew I felt something different in me. And it um, doesn't mean I didn't make mistakes. It just meant I got to start learning earlier. And so I just pray when we partake in a moment, and I know Pastor Bob will have encouraging words, and he's got thoughts for us as well, but think about what he's done for you. Don't miss the point of today. Would you sing with us on this? We bow our hearts, we bend our knees, oh Spirit come make us humble.
you hurting and broken within Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin Jesus is calling Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling Come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus today because I want to talk about this and in order not to lecture you I brought my friend Stephen and he and I are going to have a little conversation about what the Lord's Supper is I didn't bring my mic was I supposed That's okay. to okay good I have a question for you Miss Rebecca yes, sir. what is the Lord's Supper okay so that's a really good question right next to me is a statue of the 
actual Lord's Supper. This is what some artists believe it looked like when Jesus had his last supper with his disciples. It was actually a Passover dinner. The next time we have Lord's Supper, we're going to talk about the Passover. But for today, all you need to know is that it was the Passover dinner, and Jesus was eating with his disciples. And today, the reason that we celebrate this is because it symbolizes the breaking of Jesus's body and the shedding of his blood on the cross for our sins. I have another question. Why did Jesus create this? Okay, that's another good question. Um, The reason that Jesus created this, and he told his disciples the night that um, they had the dinner, he said it was to remember him. So if we could pull up this tablecloth. Sorry. It says, this do in remembrance of me. You see that? And the key word here, the big word here is this one. Remembrance. So if you're trying to think to yourself, why is it such a big deal in this church to take the Lord's Supper? It's to remember. And in your family, maybe the traditions you do or the special events you do are the same every year and you always do it a certain way. It's to remember. But this one's really important because it's to remember Jesus. And so when we eat that food and we take that cup, it's to remember Jesus' broken body and his shed blood. You got another but what question? happened after okay. the supper? So as soon as they ate the meal, the Bible tells us that they went out and Jesus was betrayed that very same night. And then the next day he was crucified. I want to read to you from Luke chapter 22. This is what's happening in this little picture over here. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover meal with you before I suffer, because I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, and Pastor Bob's going to share some of this with us too, he gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among you. I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Then he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and said, this is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine here on this table. The Son of Man will go as it has been decreed, but woe to the man who betrays him. So after the meal, Jesus was betrayed, and the next day he was killed. Does it matter what kind of bread and drink we use? No, it actually doesn't. So if you're watching us at home this morning, you might have a small container that Misty mentioned, but you don't have to. So you could have anything that you would like to use. You can use bread and a drink from your home. The, um, the men who took the Passover, um, or the, the Israelites who celebrated the Passover, always took unleavened bread because during the escape from Egypt. They didn't have time for their bread to rise, so we always eat unleavened bread. So the little wafer you get, it's very similar to what the Israelites had, but if you don't have a specific thing, you could do a different juice or you could just do crackers. We just want to celebrate the remembrance of Jesus's body and his blood. But who can participate? That's a good question. You don't have to be a member of any specific church. All you have to do is have accepted Jesus as your personal Savior. And you can be part of any church. You can be a visitor. You can be at a different church visiting their fellowship. Anyone can participate who has asked Jesus into their heart. What should we think about? Okay, so there's going to be music playing. There's going to be a time for you just to wait. If this were not the middle of a pandemic, we would wait for the ushers to bring you the the elements, and you would wait patiently. What you need to do is just think. The reason this is right here is for you to look at it as a memory. Think about Jesus' sacrifice. Think about what he did for us. You can pray and ask him to forgive you sins that he brings to your mind. You can ask him to... Um, 
You can pray for other things as well, but it's a time for us to have a personal conversation with Jesus about what's going on in our hearts. So we need to confess our sins and ask for forgiveness. I don't have any more papers. Okay, I think that's, that's good for now. So this is what you need to know. That's your 101. If you're a kid, the bags today have stuff about the Lord's Supper in them too. Um, let's pray. Dear God, thank you for everyone that came here, men, women, boys, and girls. We thank you for the opportunity to remember your body and your blood that were poured out for us. Please help us to take it seriously. Thank you for the opportunity to celebrate this ordinance of the church. In your name we pray, amen. I love what Rebecca had to say. Because this really is truly a big thing. This is a big thing. Uh, probably the biggest thing we do in the church is remembering Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, and we need to remember that. That's big. It's big. You know, one, one of the things that I love about um, when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, I think of it in a ter- time, time of global, I, I think of it globally, and I think on Sunday morning, all around the world, people of different languages, of different races, of different economic um, uh, statuses, the rich, the poor, of different ages, they are all joining together to celebrate this one way. We may look different. We may be of different nationalities. But when we join together in Jesus Christ, we are all in unity of one body, the body of Christ. This morning I'd ask that you take that wafer out. I haven't done this before, so I'm a little nervous about popping that thing out. The top clear plastic is the wafer. Before you take of it, let me ask you one thing. Have you confessed your shortcomings before God? If you're sitting here this morning and you're thinking that you're the perfect Christian, (laughs) I have some news for you. Let's take a few moments to think about and confess our needs in front of God. Heavenly gracious Father, we are all one in our appreciation of you. But Lord, we're also one in our understanding of our, all of our imperfections. So Lord, we want to come to you with clean hands and clean heart this morning. You say that if we confess our sins to one another, and we confess them to you, you will take those and push them as far as the east is from the west. You will cleanse us and cleanse our hearts. Father, we want to be clean in front of you. We want to be as white as snow in front of you as we take and participate in your Lord's Supper this morning. Jesus' name we pray. The Lord said on the night that he was betrayed, take this all of you and eat. This is my body broken for you. For as long as you meet together, do this in remembrance of me. kind of interesting
And to be honest, if this morning we fixate on the cup, we are fixating on the wrong thing. You see, during the Middle Ages, people glorified the cup. They took all the gold that they could find and they made it into something, a chalice, something beautiful. And what happens in men's mind is they glorify the cup. We don't glorify the cup. We glorify what's inside the cup. This uh, represents Jesus' blood shed for you. When you were lost in your sins and you had no way out, Jesus Christ died for you. For as long as you meet together, do this in remembrance of me. Scripture says that after they were done, they sang a hymn, they sang some songs on the way to destiny, on the way to the most important activity the world has ever seen. The reuniting of the lost with the loving and caring God of the universe. Let's pray. Heavenly Grace of Father, we just thank you that we can join together in unity, in unity, Lord, remembering what your son did for us. Lord, it would be like trying to save yourself from drowning by lifting yourself out by your hair. We can't do it on our own, Lord. But praise be to God through the intervention of Jesus Christ, our Lord. All that was broken has been repaired. And one day we are going to see him face to face in our redeemed bodies and in a redeemed world. Thank you, Lord. And thank you for this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's sing this hymn together. Do you want to stand? Grace greater than our sin. We've seen the first couple of verses.
Amen. You may be seated. Thanks, praise team. You get you all have some pretty good looking masks there. I like those. We are turning in your Bibles to the book of Revelation, chapter 3, and we're going to be starting at uh, verse 14. We are concluding a series this morning, a series that uh, I entitled uh, a couple of months ago, Imperfect Places, because what it really talks about, it talks about churches, and in particular, it talks about seven churches in the area that we call modern-day Turkey. But it could be that God is talking to each and every one of us because these seven churches, they represent something that I think is involved and we see in all churches, whether it is the seven churches in this first century or seven churches today. Jesus is doing an inspection of these churches. And and whether you are a government worker or you're in business or you're in the military, sooner or later, sooner or later, you have to go through some type of inspection. And I will tell you that the best inspections that you will ever go under are inspections that aren't a lot of fun. If the inspection is a whole lot of fun, they're not doing their job. They're not being as useful as they need to be. And I will tell you that the best inspectors, the toughest inspectors, are usually people who are vested in the success of the organization. They have some reason that they are there and they are all in because they want success for that organization. For churches, there is nobody that is more vested than Jesus. He is the chief inspector, and he wants the best for all of us. He wants to be the chief evaluator for all of our churches, but especially the chief evaluator for us, our church. Jesus is the one who is sending this message of inspection to these seven churches. Now, I just want to remind you about something. All the other letters that we see in the New Testament are written by earthly authors, inspired by God. What's different about this one is that it is written by Jesus. Now, uh, it, it was John who put it down on paper, but it was Jesus who was speaking the words. And he was speaking it in one great large message. It wasn't like he made seven different letters and secretly had them passed out to all these different churches. He passes this gigantic seven message letter out to all the churches so that they all could see. All seven churches were had benefited and did benefit from what Jesus spoke to all the other churches. This letter benefits all these seven churches, but most importantly this morning, as with all Scripture, it is relevant to us. This morning, we get to the seventh and final church, the final message. And if you you were to look at a map of Turkey today, you would see that these churches represent, and this church in particular, Laodicea, represents the last in a circuit of churches. Starting with the church at Ephesus, which was probably the largest of the churches, it was the largest city, and then ending with the church as we see it today, Laodicea. Now let me remind you of something of how how Jesus has has planned, has organized these messages. 
He identifies himself to the church in a clear, but it's also a very personable way. If you go back and you look at all seven of these messages, Jesus identifies himself differently to each one of these churches. And there's a reason for that. In the many personality, in the multiple personality of who Jesus is, Every one of us needs to see him at a different point in time, differently. Jesus speaks to us differently, personally. What he does after he identifies himself, he commends them. He commends those. He he says, that a boy. You know, uh, we all like attaboys, don't we? We all, we all like somebody to come up to her and say, man, you are doing a good job. Stephen, how you play that guitar, I, I tell you, you're just awesome, awesome. And we like that. Doesn't it make you feel good? Rebecca, that was a great message. Doesn't that make you feel good? Oh, no, it doesn't make, I'm too holy. <laughs> no, that's, no, it, it makes us feel good. But then he follows it with a critique And it's, hey, these are the areas that you can do better. And then he finalizes these messages by providing each church some direction. In the message to the church at Laodicea, there is no attaboy. There is no commending. It is only one of two churches in the list that that happens to. Jesus doesn't start off with anything good to say about the church at Laodicea. Let's read what God has to offer, and then we'll, we'll, uh, we're, we'll uh, parse this a little bit and talk a little bit more about it. Let's start at verse 14. It says this, To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other, so because you are lukewarm, neither hot or cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich in white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so that you can see. Jesus' message is personable and it is directed, directed at the church at Laodicea. No other church would have been uh, in line with the words that he said. Laodicea was an important city in the Roman Empire during the first century. It was a center of banking. It had a bunch of gold in its banks. It sat at the crossroads of several highways. It had a very large merchant class. It sold fine linens fine clothes to the people who came by. It was a medical center. People who had eye problems would come to the medical institute at Laodicea and they would use a special salve that was uh, acquired in the area around where Laodicea lied. It was a producer of this salve and it would, the salve would be used throughout the empire. About 20 years, maybe 30 years before, the city was almost entirely destroyed by an earthquake. But the city was so wealthy, Rome came to it and said, hey, we'll give you money, we'll loan you money to rebuild your city, your entire city. And many of the cities in the local area took that money. Laodicea said, nah, We'll repay for we'll pay for the building ourselves. And that's exactly what they did. And this attitude, this decision to pay and have the 
a uh, city rebuilt on it, uh, its own was a source of great pride. We are independent. We can do this on our own. And was, what was clear is that not only was this an issue with the city that took great pride in its rebuilding, it was also a problem by what Jesus says with the church itself. You know, independence can be very good. It's good to be independent sometimes. We value independent thinkers. I think we don't want our kids to grow up with following the crowd. We want them to be independent thinkers. We want them to value self-sufficiency. That I don't have to depend on anybody for my income. I don't want to ha have to come back and, and get something from mom or from dad. Uh, we value self-sufficiency. We want them to live on their own. We want them to operate on their own. I tell you, one of the greatest things for moms and dads is when they see that transition in their kids. Be being, being dependent to being independent and standing on their own two feet. Isn't that a great time for parents? At the beginning of this co current COVID-19 scare, as you remember, the government began providing support to businesses. And I think that was a good thing. I think that was well within the realm of what a government should do during those difficult times. It was the right thing. It was a good thing, I think. But in that, they included churches. Churches could apply for support as well. Many churches I know in this area took support. We, after discussing this amongst the elders, decided we would not. I think that was the right thing to do. And I was very proud of our elders' decision. But independence and deciding to do it on your own, while it's good sometimes, it can be taken to a fall. And that is what Jesus is pointing out to the church at Laodicea here. The church, I think, should be independent of the government. But it is dangerous, ladies and gentlemen, when it becomes independent from God. The core message, the core message of salvation is that left unto ourselves... We will mess things up. No matter how good we can do it, no matter how good we can be, we will never meet the standard of perfection. And it is only through this intervention of God, it is only through Jesus Christ's sacrifice on the cross and the Holy Spirit that we are made whole. Independence becomes dangerous when individuals think they determine what is right and what is wrong. Independence is dangerous for a church when it thinks that it arrived. Hey, everything's good. We have built a beautiful uh, uh, building and we're, we're meeting our budget and everything. Everything's great. We've arrived. We are there. Independence is dangerous when it causes people to retreat from society rather to engage the way God has called us to engage. Independence is dangerous when it causes people to think they need no one, including God. The church at Laodicea was in the danger zone, and they didn't even know it. They didn't even realize it. They were so caught up with themselves, they didn't see what they were missing. And what they were missing was God. 
there's a risk to this independence. There is a risk to being self-satisfied with where you are. It makes you complacent. You feel like there is nothing more to do. Jesus calls this church a lukewarm church using the analogy of the terrible water in Laodicea. I mean, the water in Laodicea is even worse than the water in Bealton. It was that bad. In contrast to its neighbors at Colossae where the water was cold and refreshing the wa- and the uh, uh, hot springs at Heriopolis where the water was nice and warm and soothing, Laodicea depended on lukewarm water from an aqueduct. And it was water that would keep you alive, but it wasn't very satisfying. Like that water, Jesus was ready to spit this church, the Laodicean church, out of his mouth. Prosperity can do dangerous things to people. We all want to be prosperous, don't we? We all want to be self-sufficient, don't we? We all want to be rich. God, if I could just win the lottery this week, you know, it would be so good. We all want to be that way, but everything that the Bible tells us is that prosperity can be just as dangerous as nothing at all. 1 Timothy 6.9 warns, those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Jesus said, how difficult it is for the rich to inherit the kingdom of God. Wealth quickly takes hold of us. It has this trapping about us. You know, when I started my, uh, my Air Force career, I had a friend, and he was an older man. He told me he was a chief master sergeant in the Air Force, and he said, Lieutenant, what I would tell you is that as you move up the ranks and you get promoted and you get increases in your salary, Try to let your cost of living stay the same. He said, because otherwise, you're going to move up this ladder, and every time you get a promotion, and every time you get a raise, you're going to live at that raise, and pretty soon you'll think that you deserve it. I think that was pretty wise. It's so easy to let prosperity become a substitute for the real goal of pursuing God and his righteousness. God is a good father. God withholds sometimes, choosing instead not to give us prosperity as the world sees prosperity, but chooses to give us what we truly need. God is in our lives for the long term. And he wants the best for us in the long term. To this church that seemed to have so many things going wrong for it, Jesus ends in a very peculiar way. I think I've heard a lot of messages on Laodicea. And... They, they, they really slam this place pretty hard. Jesus doesn't. He ends with a message of hope. This is what Jesus says. Those whom I love I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I come to you and I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come and eat with that person and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on the throne just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, ears, 
Let them hear what the Spirit says to the church. Are you thankful for honest people in your life that give you an assessment that is true? I have to say, I I am thankful for people who are honest in their assessment of me. A number of years ago, I was made the commander of a failing unit. They fired the previous commander, and within a couple of weeks, I found myself down in Panama from uh, the luxurious apartment in Newport News. I was down in Panama. And um, there was a lot of problems. And after about a year of what I thought we were doing and doing what I thought was better, I felt like it was time for somebody to come down and do an inspection. To do an inspection. Now the person who led the inspection was one of my best friends. She was in uh, training school with me. We had followed each other's career back and forth. Sometimes I was there first, and then she would come, and then she was there first, and I would follow her. And we were very close. After about a week, she and her team came in, and she gave the results of her inspection. It was a glowing report. It was wonderful. It was great for my ego. I mean, I loved the report. But it was wrong. It was wrong. So I called up to my boss at Langley, and I requested that they allow this inspection team to stay one more week and do it again. The results were a lot more balanced the second time. But I will tell you, they were a lot more helpful. People who love you, good friends, speak truth into your life. Stephen Beechner and I have talked about this a number of times. You know, if I decided how I was as a preacher based on what you guys tell me at the back door, I would see myself as Billy Graham. (laughs) Nobody tells me, you did a rotten job this morning. Well, that's not true, because about a year and a half ago, I was speaking on a Sunday morning at the 11 o'clock service, and a man came by somebody I trust, and he goes, Bob, I disagreed with everything you said this morning. That was a good comment. Because we got together that week, and we had some, um, um, we had meal fellowship, and I heard what he had to say, and some of the things that he interpreted out of of my sermon, he was exactly right on, except I didn't mean them to come across that way. It was a good evaluation. Good friends speak truth into your life. It is bad news when you surround yourself with yes men to tell you what you want to hear. It is bad news when you surround yourself with people who only say the things you like to hear, and if they say something against you, they, you fire them. Good friends love you so much. They love you so much, they are willing to take the risk of speaking uncomfortable truths into your life. That is exactly what Jesus does to the church at Laodicea. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. In closing out this series, I can't help but wonder what Jesus' message to Bealton Baptist Church would be. Just imagine for a moment that Instead of some road in Turkey, some circuitous road in Turkey, Jesus was writing to the churches 
along Route 17. And he was starting in Warrington and he was working his way down to Fredericksburg and he picks Bealton Baptist Church. What would he say? I don't care what he would say about those other churches. I'd probably learn from what he would say. But let's not get fixated on what Jesus says about other churches. Let's get fixated on what Jesus says about us. Those are the things, those critiques help us. They encourage us. What would he say? I think he would have some good things to say. I think he would. I hope he would. But it would be very interested in what his critique would be. How could we improve? How could we clean up things that maybe because we've just gotten so used to doing them that we just kind of gloss over them? What would be those things that we change? Guys, I have to tell you, I, I love collecting business quotes, quotes. And in, in fact, I, I find quotes really help me during times of discouragement. And they're quotes that kind of inspire me during times where I need to be inspired. And one of my favorite quotes I have uh, hanging up in my office, and it's, it's by Andy Grove. Andy Grove was the CEO a number of years ago of Intel Corp, one of the big producers of, uh, of uh, uh, microchips, big producer. He wrote a book, and it was a great title. It was called, called Only the Paranoid Survive. That was the name of the book. And this is his quote. If we got kicked out, and the board brought in a new CEO, what would he do? If we got kicked out and the board brought in a new CEO, what would he do? Why shouldn't we walk out the door, come back in, and do it ourselves? What does God want us to improve here at Bilton Baptist Church? What would he want us to do? And instead of waiting for the next guy to come in and the next people to come in, why don't we walk out the door, come back in, and do it ourselves? That's what Jesus is saying to the church at Laodicea. Get your acts together. Let me ask you something. Sunday afternoon. You walk out to your mailbox because you haven't checked it in over a week. Nobody sends you anything. Every, all my bills come email now. And you go out to that mailbox and there's a white letter in it, business letter, can't see in it. and it has your name on it, no return address. And it, you open it up, and that letter is from Jesus. And it says, to the church at the house of Gordon, to the church at the house of Puffenbarger, to the church at the house of Hutchinson, to the church at the house of Beechner. These are my words for you. What would it say? What would it say? In what ways would that letter tell you that you needed to improve? He who has an ear, let them hear. Let us pray.
Lord, um, this, this, this series on these seven churches has been good for me. It hasn't been fun. It hasn't. Because as we've gone through these seven churches, some of your words have made me feel very uncomfortable. I like discomfort, Lord. Because it's when we are uncomfortable in where we're at that we move to where we need to be. And we as a church need to keep moving. We need to move on. We need to stop wallowing in our grief about COVID-19 and move on. Do what you have called us to do. No virus is bigger than you. No riot is bigger than you. No fear is bigger than you. Help us to hear what the, the sevenfold spirit has to say to us. Father, we, uh, this morning, we bow our knee to you. We bow our knee to you. And we ask you in humility to commend and critique us as only you can. And help us to move on in boldness and in strength. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with us as we sing Build My Life? We live.
Encourage one another. We love you guys. Have a great week.